Sure is now. <clears throat> Okay, so let's look at looking at the second one. Um, if I use i as my indexing variable, what should it start at? Yeah, just one, and what should it go up to? Up to eight. And then uh, when I was going through the groups, it seems like most people got that it should be i squared, right? Which makes sense. All these terms are just an integer squared. Uh, yeah, that's true. You could start i equals zero because if you add zero, it doesn't change the sum. Mm -hmm. All right. So yeah, so let's look at the next one. So I could show you all two ways to write the next one: one starting at zero and one starting um, at one. All right. So even numbers can be written as basically 2 times k, where k is any integer. And odd numbers you can write as, you could write them as 2k minus 1 or 2k plus 1, where k is any integer. So if I plug, like if I let k be 5, then 2k is 10, so that's an even number. Uh, 2k minus 1 is 9, that's an odd number. 2k plus 1 is 11, that's also an odd number. All right, so this is sort of how you can characterize even and odd numbers, whether they take one of the following forms. So you can use um, either of these to write out this sum, and maybe I'll use and I'll use i instead of k. So for example, if I took the sum two i minus one, do I? Would I want to start this one at 1 or 0? Think about like if you plug in 1 or 0, what are you getting? Uh-huh. So if I plug in 1, I get 2 minus 1, which is 1. And that is the first. Um, so it's not just because it's because it's odd, because I can start it at 0 as well if I use the other expression. So using this expression, I would start at i equals 1. Because if I plug 1 into this, I get 2 times 1 minus 1, which is 1, and that is my first term here. All right. What do I need to plug into it to get the last term? Good. So 51. OK, if I plug 51 into the expression 2i minus 1, I get 102 minus 1, which is 101. All right. The other way of writing, or another way of writing this is I could use um, 2i plus 1. Then I could start at 0 and go up to 50. Now if you plug 0 in, you get 2 times 0 plus 1, which is just 1. Or if you plug 50 in, you get um, 100 plus 1, so the 101 term. OK. So that's just kind of like taking um, a big sum and writing it in sigma notation. Now let's see how to like actually evaluate some um, expressions from sigma notation. All right. So we're given the following summation formulas. All right. Um, the idea behind this one, like any, anything that doesn't depend on i can be, that's like a factor, can be pulled out of the sum. All right. So the sum from i equals 1 to n of some constant c, it's not depending on i. That, that just means that I'm adding c to itself n times, which is like the definition of multiplication. So I get c times n. Or you can think about it as like you factor the c out. And then I'm just adding 1 to itself n times, which is just n. So you get c times n. All right. So looking at the first one, if, um, if I just evaluate the sum from 1 to n of the term 16, what should I get?
So 16 is a constant, yeah? Yeah, it's just 16 in. Okay, uh, I'm going to skip to D because I want you all to work on a few of these. But looking at D, again, you can anything that doesn't depend on I, if it's like factored, if it's like multiple, if the, if, if the terms are just being multiplied, you can pull that outside of the summation. So this sum is the same thing as the sum from 1 to n of I, and I'm just multiplying by 6 over n. Okay, you can't pull the i out because that's var that's varying as the index changes. All right, but the six over n part doesn't change at all. So to evaluate this, it'll be six over n times this sum. But I, I we're given an expression for this sum here. All right, if I just sum i with its i from one to n, I get n times n plus one over two. Okay, so this ends up evaluating to 3 times n plus 1. The n's cancel out, and 6 over 2 gives me 3. All right, uh, so I'm going to break out into groups again, and I want you all to look at B, C, and E.
Okay, so um, let's look at these. So the first one maybe looks tricky, having this like dividing by n. But remember, n doesn't depend on the indexing variable i. n is a fixed quantity. It's not like changing per term in the sum. So this is all really just a constant again. Okay, so this is really just the same thing as i equals 1 to n. 8 times 2 is 16, so I could write this as 16 over n. And then you're just using this formula. The sum from uh, 1 to n of a constant is just the constant times n. So 16 over n is a constant. So I just get 16 over n times n, or 16. OK? Uh, part C is the sum from 1 to n of just the term i. So that's given to us explicitly in the summation formulas above. And we use it in the next problem as well, right? So if I just sum i from 1 to n, the formula is just n times n plus 1 over 2. OK, and finally, this expression here is a little more complicated. Um, but again, like everything that doesn't, everything's being multiplied, right? And everything that doesn't depend on i, if we choose to, we could factor it out or we can like move it outside of the summation. So I can write this as, so I have like 6 times 2 over n times n. So 12 over n squared. Or let me write it that way first inside. All right, 12 over n squared is just a constant. So this just looks like 12 over n squared sum i equals 1 to n of the term i. All right, so this, this summation now we just replace with n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, so 12 over 2 gives me 6. Uh, one of the n's in the denominator cancels out with the n in the numerator, and we're left with the n plus 1 over n term. All right, so now, now we'll do some more sort of like preliminary work before we start um, trying to evaluate an integral. So n's a constant because it's not, it's not like changing with i. Like, when I look here at this, like, uh, the sum from 1 to 6 of i, like, i is the thing that changes as I go from term to term. So I'm going from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6. But n is, like, predetermined. It's already, we already knew that n was going to be 6, right? It's not, like, changing. It doesn't change, like, with each term in the sum. Okay, all right, so now let's look at like taking an interval and dividing it into n subintervals. So we've sort of done this before, but now we're, and we've done it in discussion and stuff, but now we're just going to like write it out um, a little more explicitly. All right, so if I divide the interval from 2 to 4 into n subintervals of equal length delta x, then delta x will be 4 minus 2 over n, which is just 2 over n. All right, so here we're just trying to come up with, an, a, way, with a way to like express these um, grid points, like x1, x2, xi, up to xn, where you actually measure the height of the function. So we want to come up with sort of like a, a formula or a sequence of those that, that we can write um, as like an algebraic expression. All right, 
So x naught will generally just always be the leftmost endpoint or the left endpoint of your big interval from two to four. So x naught will just be two. And then x1 just means you, you take the previous point and you add delta x to it. You just shift over delta x, which is the width of one subinterval. So this is just x naught plus delta x, all right, which becomes 2 plus 2 over n. Because 2 is x naught and 2 over n is the width of our interval. All right, x2 is just x1 plus delta x. So that's 2 plus 2 over n. That's x1. And then I add delta x. So I add 2 over n. All right, and this can be written as 2 plus 4 over n. All right, and this pattern will hold. I just keep adding 2 over n, which means I keep just adding 2 to the numerator of the over n term. So x3 will be 2 plus 6 over n. And then a general way of writing these points, where like i is an arbitrary subindex, like 1, 2, 3, what have you, is 2 plus 2i over n. Okay, so these are these are the endpoints of the subinterval. Two plus two, they all take this form two plus two i over n, where I let i vary. All right, and we'll use this to actually like compute um, a definite integral. Okay, so recall the definite integral is is this limit, and this is just the limit of the Riemann sums. This is the same thing as we that that I wrote at the beginning of class. All right, where a to b is divided into n subintervals, so that's kind of what we just did, and x sub i are the evaluation points. All right, so we're going to use the limit definition to try to evaluate this definite integral. All right, and we'll use some of the computations that we've done before, which is part of the reasons, part of the way they were chosen. All right, to start this off, so let's kind of like, let's look at what we're doing here a bit. So 3x plus 2 is just a straight line. Uh, if I plug 2 into it, I get 8. If I plug 4 into it, I get 14. OK, and we're trying to measure the area under the curve. All right, we're going to do that by picking out um, these evaluation points, well, we'll uh, you basically pick a number n to use how many rectangles you use. And then that'll give you um, these, evalu these evaluation points, x sub i. And then depending on n, that'll change delta x. which tells you um, how wide your rectangles be. And then f of x of i is the height of the rectangle. OK, so for any value of n, we can compute a Riemann sum, which will give us an approximation. And then we let n go to infinity. And that's the, the definition of a, of a definite integral. All right, so let's get into this. So if we divide the interval from 2 to 4 into n subintervals, what would delta x be? What are the what is the width of the rectangles? Yep. 
Yeah, two over n. We just, yeah, basically. Almost everything in here is stuff that we've computed getting to this point. All right, what is x of i? So almost, don't forget the, the plus 2. So this it's this term here that you can all see. This 2 plus 2i two over n. All right, f of x is the function that we're integrating. So that's 3x plus 2. All right, the expression that we actually sort of like plug in to the, to the summation is f of x of i times delta x. All right, so let's see, what is f of x of i? So our function is 3x plus 2. x of i is this expression 2 plus 2i over n. So I'm going to like plug that expression. I'm going to I'm going to replace x with that expression. So I'll get uh, 3 times 2 plus 2i over n plus 2. So this will give me 6 plus 6i over n plus 2, or 8 plus 6i over n. Okay, so this is f of x sub i. All right, so now let's go to the last step and just like see what is what is the sum band. So f of x sub i times delta x. So this is going to be the like the, the sum band of our of our sigma. All right. So we plug in for f of x sub i. We have eight plus six i over n. That's what we just found. Delta x. So I'm multiplying here. Delta x is 2 over n. OK, and we can just distribute now the 2 over n. So 8 times 2 over n is 16 over n. 6i over n times 2 over n is 12i over n squared. All right, now we can try to evaluate uh, the right-hand side of this expression, of this part C. Like the left-hand side is, this is the definition sort of of the integral. We're going to evaluate it by looking at the right-hand side. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity, sum i equals 1 to n. And inside of this sum is like the, the height of the, or sorry, the area of a rectangle, f of x of i times delta x. And we've just written out that expression here. All right, so inside of the sum goes 16 over n plus 12i over n squared. All right, so uh, I'm going to split you into groups, and I want you all to try to finish this problem, so evaluate this limit. So before you like before you worry about the limit at all, you really just want to come up with an expression for the sum, just like like we did up here, where we took a sum and we ended up getting some expression just in terms of n. Then you could take a limit as n goes to infinity. All right. So first try to like evaluate the sum, then take the limit going to infinity.
Okay, um, so there's sort of, um, I guess, like a, a theorem that I kind of forgot to say, which is that you can separate a sum over, over like the, the sigma. So if I have the sum from 1 to n of two expressions like a sub i plus b sub i, this is the same thing as the sum of a sub i plus the sum of b sub i. Right? So we can separate this, like the, the, the expression inside of the sigma is a sum in itself, so we can separate that. And we get the limit sort of stays outside, way outside. And we'll have the sum from i equals 1 to n of 16 over n plus the sum i equals 1 to n, 12i over n squared. All right? Each of these sums now, we've already evaluated. We did that on the first page. Um, the sum of 16 over n was 16. The sum of 12i over n squared was here. And that was 6 times n plus 1 over n. So this becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of 16 plus 6 times n plus 1 over n. All right, and now, so now it's just an expression in terms of n, and we can evaluate it. All right, so if I take the limit as n goes to infinity, the first term is just 16, so what does that approach? It's just a constant. It's not quite zero. It's another constant. So, so just, just, just the term 16. Yeah. How does, does 16 depend on n? No. Right. So if I take a limit as n goes to infinity, it's, it's completely unaffected by the fact that n is changing. So it's just it just remains 16. Okay, now the next term, 6 to the n plus 1 over n, what will that approach as n goes to infinity? Okay, and then what? If you apply L'Hopital's rule, or you could you could do the um, so don't don't forget about the six that's in front. Yes, it'll go to six, right? If you take the derivative, you'll just get uh, six over one. Or if you use L'Hopital's rule to take the derivative of the top and bottom, so you'll get six, and that just gives us twenty-two. So that's our answer. The integral from two to 4 of 3x plus 2 dx is 22. All right, we can try to um, verify this sort of geometrically. So 2, if I plug it into 3x plus 2, I get 8. 4, if I plug it into 3x plus 2, I get 14. All right, so this area, you can break it into two geometric shapes, or one is a triangle um, and one is a square.
the square will have width 2, height 8. Uh, the rectangle, or sorry, the triangle will have width 2, or base 2, and the height will be 14 minus 8, or 6. All right. So the area under this curve is the area of a rectangle plus the area of a triangle. And this will be 2 times 8 plus 1 half 2 times 6, which is 16 plus 6, or 22, which is exactly what we got before. All right, so you may think, like, why didn't we just do this to begin with? And you can if it's a, if your function is a straight line, then measuring the area underneath it is not hard if it's a linear function. But if it's not a linear function, then we don't really have hope of using this sort of, like, geometry um, to evaluate it. So you could do this um, Riemann sum way, which is sort of like the rigorous definition. And maybe for, like, small polynomials, it's not too bad. It's, like, on the order of two or three. But still, like, generally, it's too hard. Um, so what we're going to do on Wednesday is learn the fundamental theorem, which will make this sort of problem a little bit easier for us. All right. Uh, so that's all. Uh, I will, I have office hours at four. It'll be in the main, like the course room, the main course room. Um, but otherwise I'll see y'all on Wednesday. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Afifa, to be honest, I don't know. I'll ask. Uh, I'll, I'll 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 ask Tabes, and I'll I'll email you what he tells me. I think some people didn't sign them, so we have to like email them and see if they like claim the work that they did. Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, I, I got it. I got it. I'll, I'll resubmit it on grade. I'll, I can resubmit it on grade scope. All right, have a good one.